Uh, on the line with us is Rachel Bittekoffer, the elections analyst. You can read her articles over at Substack and The Cycle. Check out her podcast, The Election Whisperer, thecycle.substack.com. Uh, Rachel Bittekoffer, B-I-T-E-C-O-F-E-R is her Twitter handle. And Rachel, welcome back to the program. It's been a while since you've been on. You, you uh, dropped me a note about the Oregon uh, governor's race. And Betsy Johnson yesterday uh, finally got all the all the signatures that she needs and turn, turned them in. She apparently paid $200,000 to uh, Referendum Campaign Management Services, uh, Initiative and Referendum Campaign Management Services, to, uh, to score these uh, signatures for her. Uh, tell us uh, why you're concerned about this race. I mean, yeah, there's very few petitions that money can't fill out, right? So that's very key. But that's exactly why this race is so interesting um, and perhaps problematic for Oregon Democrats. The situation here in Oregon is such that, you know, it's, it's very common for third party candidates, independents, Green Party libertarians and in Oregon more to be on the ballot. What's unusual is we've not seen a well-financed uh, independent candidate, somebody who has a pocketbook to pay for professional petition gatherings, and also, I'll note, has been on the air with paid television, which is the most expensive component of any campaign since the primary, um, right. which, you know, she wasn't even running in. So it's really um, uh, shaping up to be quite an interesting dynamic with effectively two Democrats and one Republican on the general election. She's uh, Be Betsy Johnson. Louise and I, uh, actually Louise mostly, listened to the debate that they had with her and, and, and um, Tina Kotek, who is, was my state representative, was the Speaker of the House and is now running for governor. And uh, I'm forgetting the third person, the Republican. But um, Betsy did, you know, did a really good job in that debate and, and was the, uh, clearly the, the, quote, law and order candidate. And that's becoming quite an issue, I think, for much of Oregon. Um, she used to be a Democrat. She does have the support of two of the uh, more prominent billionaires in this state, uh, Phil Knight, who started Nike, and I'm forgetting the guy's name, but he's the founder of Columbia Sportswear. And uh, maybe he's not a billionaire, but he's a very, very wealthy guy. And, and these two are f helping fund her campaign. What does all that mean? I mean, what, wh why is this problematic for Democrats or for the state of Oregon if, if, a, if a woman who used to be a Democrat um, and has the support of these billionaires becomes our governor. Yeah, you know, I mean, that that's less of my concern, to be honest with you, Tom. I, I mean, I think there's very few scenarios in which Betsy Johnson can win outright the governorship of Oregon. I think if we were living in a different time period and we had the problems of homelessness and crime to exploit, we would be talking about a different um, scenario. There is, you know, it's rare, but occasionally an independent can win a major elected office. So, uh, but right now we're really talking about a time period that dictates the politics. Uh, more and more people are becoming aware of the democratic crisis facing America. So her candidacy is, is much less likely to produce a win as it is to uh, potentially separate the, the left side of the Democrats coalition, which is going to include a good chunk of the state's independence. Um, and if, if their votes end up you know, um, getting spread out between two Democrats, then the Republican Party has a very solid floor in Oregon. It's really um, what we should be looking at is how bad historically has the Republican done statewide in the governor's race. Mm. And it, it's about 42, 43 percent. So you can see very easily, um, you know, a race between two people. Democrats have a decisive advantage. We probably aren't even going to be talking about that race. But a race against three people really does so, position the Republican. Right. So what well. you're saying is that she could play the role of spoiler. If she can pull five, 10 percent of the Democratic votes away from Tina Kotek, um, then the Republican candidate becomes governor. That's that's your argument. That's your. Concern. That's exactly right. And I'm basing those two two things on two things that are. are, are you know, supported by data analytics, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, number one, that floor figure. And the reality is that, you know, even a poorly financed but somewhat salient independent or spoiler campaign can usually get two to three percent in the actual vote tally. But somebody who has is running the Johnson campaign is being run better than you know, um, honestly, most Democratic campaigns would ever get run. Right. Very shrewd management. So and it's not just that they have the money, it's that they have a good candidate, a good message, and a good strategy to uh, support her with. So my assumption is, 
you know, and, and, th and this is based on survey data looking at um, independent voter or like, you know, third party voter behavior in national data, we tend to see because hyper partisanship and tribalism is less um, pronounced on that left side of the coalition. The um, real reality is that more people will defect that would vote for Tina Kotak than that would ever have cast a ballot for Christine Dresden. Uh, Republican defection into third party scenarios is, 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 is very hard. Right. Uh, so what what is I mean, you, you're you're famous, you're literally world famous as an analyst of elections and, and predicting election outcomes. Um, what do you think? Uh, two questions. Number one, why are these two billionaires supporting this third party candidacy? Is it because they want to see a Republican elected? And yeah, Tom, I'm so glad that you're highlighting that because, you know, here's an opportunity, I hope, for me to, to speak to them or perhaps people who speak to them, you know, um, themselves. And this is what I would like to ask them is, is this worth the risk right now? We're looking at a situation in which the neighboring state, Idaho, is going to have a human rights um, crisis with women who are unable to access reproductive care. And we need the state of Oregon to be in a position to help those women. This is not the time for, uh, you don't rebuild a house while it is still on fire. And although I am very sensitive to the complaints that Johnson's making in her advertising, and understand how its potential to re resonate within this electorate. Um, I am here to say that that we are we are really looking at a potential spoiler scenario in Oregon, and the worst thing to give Betsy Johnson is more money. Yeah, well, but she doesn't seem to need it. I mean, she's got a couple of billionaires shoveling money at her. Um, right. So, so is there? I mean, other than pointing this out. Uh, is there any kind of strategy that the Democrats can or should use against her? Because, I mean, it's, it's like, you know, she was a Democrat. It's, it's, it's sort of like, you know, the Greens running, running in, a, in, a, in an election with, the, you know, pulling votes away from Democrats. It's, it's not like she's, you know, a, a, a Republican coming in all sneaky and stuff. Yeah, I mean, I have no doubt that Betsy Johnson and her team sincerely believe in the mission of providing a more centrist, you know, um, um, voting option and uh, and also probably genuinely believe that their effort is going to produce a victory and not just give the state to the Republican Party. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the problem with campaigns and, and internal analytics is that they are really subject to groupthink and confirmation bias. And as a political scientist, I am here to tell you the most likely scenario that we're going to see as of today is Johnson performing somewhere around 10 to 15 percent on that general election ballot with the amount of money and resources if they are able to keep that advertising constant through the general. And if that is to happen, it will take Democrats potentially below that floor for Republicans. Wow. Wow. And we end up with a Republican governor, which, which, as you say, could do a, an awful lot of damage to this state. Um, and you have no, no uh, suggestions about how to prevent this. No, I actually have lots of suggestions. I mean, I, you know, I'll tell you that to the Democratic Party of Oregon's defense, Johnson, um, you know, she's kind of like Manchin, but she's she's she's, um, you know, um, kind of a thorn in the side of the party caucus, from what I understand. So I think that, you know, within the party's efforts, you know, to try to rein her in or keep her from running, we're exhausted and 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 what I am here not received well. So I I'm, I'm, I what I would say now is it's going to come down. Down to two things is going to come down to the COTAC and the Democratic Party of Oregon strategy on how to convince people not to protest ballot on the issue of homelessness, because that's really what Betsy Johnson's campaign is going to zero in on. And the other thing I, is to get the, the public aware, we have a potential spoiler effect in Oregon. This is probably the time if you vote for Green Party candidates traditionally in the state or um, some other third party to throw your vote behind the Democratic Party, because the stakes are quite high. Right. Yeah. So uh, get out there, get active, tag your head, in other words. And right. vote for Democrats all the way up and down the ballot. There you go. Rachel Bittico for PhD, elections analyst. Uh, you can read her work over at thecycle.substack.com. Uh, Twitter handle Rachel Bittico, B-I-T-E-C-O-F-E-R, B Rachel Bittico. Rachel, thanks so much for dropping by. Fascinating Can't conversation. Thank you guys enough for the time. Thanks. My pleasure. Good talking with you.